Hello and welcome to Housing Today Live 2024. Today, myself and our panel of experts will be exploring the impact of sustainability regulatory changes on the UK housing sector. This is our second and last webinar today. Earlier, my colleague Carl Brown spoke with an expert panel about the implications of AWAB's law on for housing providers. So if you're interested in that, you can access a recording on our website. Likewise, this session will be available to rewatch later today using the same link you've used to join us now. The recording should be ready within about half an hour of us finishing here. Um, for this panel, make sure to send us any questions you have um, throughout as it'll help us get the most out of our interesting panel. Speaking of whom, let me introduce them. We've got Richard Ellis, who is Director of Sustainability at Peabody, Mitch Cook, who is Director of Green Gauge, and we're hoping to be joined by Lynn Sullivan, who is Chair of the Good Homes Alliance. She's having a bit of a technical trouble now, but hopefully we'll be able to get her on in time to talk to you. So I'm sure you're all as keen to, as I am to hear from our panellists, so let's get right into it. Richard, can you kick us off? Yes, of course. Uh, thank you for letting me come in. Let me know when uh, you can see my screen. I'm just going to share a couple of slides. Can you see that, everyone? I'm going to go for a yes. Looks good to me. Uh, great. Thank you. So, yes, uh, a little bit of blurb about, about Peabody. We've got 107,000 homes, uh, 230,000 residents. We've got a way to go to get to uh, net zero carbon, but we're working our way there. So we've got 78% of our existing state is EPC A to C. We've got about 24, 25,000 homes we need to get up to EPC C and then to go beyond. Uh, we've got 220 heat, uh, heat networks as well, quite a lot, uh, but we're being mandated more and more about that. And I'll talk about that later. We want to get to EPC C by 2030 and then net zero by 2050. We have looked about trying to get it sooner, and at the moment, it's just really, really tough. Uh, but we built, and we built uh, 2,400 homes last year. So a couple of things I want to pick up um, today is one around the future homes and building standards. Uh, this is coming in in uh, 2025. Essentially, we're going to be looking at electrified heat and hot water. So we need to get ready for that. Uh, there are a number of issues and problems around it, grid capacity, grid supply, um, getting the right type of heating into our properties. Um, but it's it's coming and it's something that we're going to have to deal with. So what, how we're looking at it is around reducing down the energy demand. I know that the uh, future home standard doesn't say much uh, unfortunately, about improving thermal performance, but uh, of the of the of the fabric, but we're looking to see whether or not we can reach passive house standards. So reduce the energy demand. We're briefing passive house at the moment. We're looking to, but however, we recognise that we're in a, obviously a competitive market and the 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 uh, schemes need to stack up. So we are actually following a twin track approach so we do it we're, we're when we're tendering we tender for passive house and then we also tender for what meets the future home standard we've got biodiversity gain but lynn i think is going to talk much more around that so we've, we've brought that in and we're also looking at climate resilience in design so we we use overheating models we use uh flood risk maps to see how we can design something that's going to be good for not the next five years, 10 years, but the next 20, next 30 years. One of the other things that we're looking to do, which I'll come on to in a bit, is actually scenario planning. So what happens in the world, what risks and opportunities are we going to find when we, when we hit 1.5 degrees, when we hit 2 to 3 degrees, and then 4 degrees, which unfortunately we're on track for at the moment. All of that we take to inform our new homes. The other thing I wanted to pick up was around heat networks. As I said, we, we've got an awful lot of heat networks, um, but and at the moment they are unregulated and unregulated space. 
they are going to be regulated from 2025. It keeps drifting, but it, um, we, um, the last I've been told it is that it's definitely going to be regulated. Ofgem are going to be the regulator. It will give us consumer protection. And I'm sure everyone has seen in the papers last year, people had their heat network tariffs go up by 900%. This will give us a little bit more protection around that. There are improvement of standards, stepping arrangements as well. What happens if an ESCO fails? Um, and then we've got our heat network zoning as well. But it will apply to all communal heat and district heat networks. It's a really big thing, and it's something that we're working very hard in the background to try and make sure that we get all of the information together so that we can show what we're doing for our residents and for um, the regulator. Um, okay. And then going on from uh, to heat zoning, we know this is going to come in probably in five or six years' time. Uh, they're already starting to carve up the, uh, the country, and especially certainly the cities in terms of where there's going to be a heat network zone. Uh, those will then be uh, tendered and you'll have a heat network zone operator from there. As, as I understand it, <laughs> it may change, but that's what they're talking about at the moment. And the, uh, the idea here is to grow our heat networks from 3% that we've got in the country at the moment to about 20% um, and to get uh, cheaper and cleaner heat in and to normalize it it happens in the continent all the time but we've never really uh, got to grips with heat networks we tried it in the 60s and 70s and 80s but they've been ripped out when cheap gas came in so it's something to be aware of and again it's something that we have to look at when we're looking at our existing estates and when we're looking at our new estates and then the other thing that i wanted to pick up um, and we could talk later on if people want to talk around uh, retrofitting. But the other thing I wanted to talk about was finance. So the big thing that we've seen over the last year or so is the increasing demands in reporting from our lenders um, and our ESG loans and when we're, we're talking to the banks. The banks were told uh, by their regulator they have to start managing downstream climate risk, so their scope three emissions. Uh, to do that, there's a methodology that came out, and I'm going to get this wrong, so apologies, but it's a task force related climate financial disclosures. That close, but it's moving into the financial re reporting regulations. So we're looking at what's the governance around climate risk? What's, what's your climate strategy? What's your risk management? And what are the metrics and targets? People are asking for this in huge amounts of detail now and we're seeing the impact of that in terms of what we're trying to do um we are about to start doing a, a, a tcfd um gap analysis to see what we need to learn and how we can improve but in the last two audits that i've had external audits on our business plan they're using this methodology so it's certainly something to uh get your head around and ha start having a look at it. If we can get this right, we will have access to more funding and hopefully slightly cheaper funding. But it's a real thing that's sort of developed over the last year and a half, two years. And it is due to come in in 2025 um, for the listed, property, listed companies first, but it will come down to the larger housing associations. All right, that, that's a, just a very whistle stop tour of what uh, we're really looking at at the moment. Um, hopefully that's okay. Great, thanks very much, Richard. Um, we're gonna hear from Mitch now. Um, just as a note, could the speakers remember to mute while uh, they're not giving their presentations? Um, and uh, please keep uh, sending your uh, questions through the chat. Uh, Mitch, over to you. Thank you very much. I'll try to share my screen. Um, Can you see this now? Can you see that now? Okay, yeah. Looks good, yeah. Okay, brilliant. Thank you very much. So um, thank you for having me on this afternoon. Um, I will give a little bit of an introduction to who I am and Green Gauge, but I wanted most of the presentation to be around uh, biodiversity, which is uh, something that I'll be talking about in today's slot. So 
Um, I am one of the directors at Green Gauge. Green Gauge is a sustainability consultancy. We cluster our services around three principal challenges. First is climate change. So looking at how buildings um, align with net zero. Um, the second is essentially looking at biodiversity in nature and how we can address the biodiversity decline. And the third is about the interaction between uh, green infrastructure and nature-based solutions and the community. So how the, the, the wider social value component. So um, that's a bit about who we are. So I'm gonna talk about biodiversity, if I can get the slides to work. No. <laughs> okay, I think we might have to just make it the old style way. Uh, so you can see the next slide. So I'm going to talk about biodiversity and nature. Um, obviously, one of the main changes that have happened uh, over the last few years, but from a mandatory point of view earlier this year, is the introduction of biodiversity net gain as a requirement for new developments. Now, there are some uh, exemptions to that, but generally um, what we'll see is that all new developments that um, are being brought forward will require a biodiversity net gain assessment and a re mandatory requirement of a 10% uplift. The uh, biodiversity net gain is a metric that looks at habitats, so it's very good in terms of understanding the habitat change and the uplift in habitat value is a proxy measure for biodiversity. But one of the things it doesn't do is it doesn't really look at biodiversity in nature in the wider sense. So it's good as a proxy for biodiversity in nature, but doesn't look necessarily as the increase um, in terms of species diversity for birds and bats and for invertebrates, for example. Um, however, what it has done is it has brought forward the discussion about biodiversity to the very front end of the development process, um, certainly in terms of site selection, but also layouts and the implication of landscaping and the nature of that landscaping. Um, for those that haven't seen it yet, the picture on the right hand side is a, pic is a picture of the metric itself, um, but also the output of what that delivers. And I guess the point here is for most urban developments, delivery of biodiversity, net gain and 10% mandatory requirement is relatively straightforward. Um, those that have any vegetative cover of any sort, be it playing field or um, uh, kind of scrubby areas, those are more difficult to deliver biodiversity uplift. But those sites that we're seeing in, in urban areas red, are relatively simple. And that means that whilst it is a good metric and a good um, measure of biodiversity, what it doesn't do is give that broader biodiversity um, value across different species mixes. Um, but what we have seen, of course, is that it then looks at how biodiversity might be implemented across schemes and the value that green spaces and habitats are, cr are creating. And this green infrastructure or the vegetative connected spaces have a wider benefit that is now being looked at um, both in terms of placemaking, but in a range of different um, features overall. Those people that um, are familiar with the London context and for context is in other urban areas, whilst we're seeing biodiversity net gain as a habitat, these are the sort of features that should also be incorporated. So those pictures show things like sandy piles, uh, log piles, areas of pebbles, and that gives the broader biodiversity value that, that uh, delivers um, uh, think, you know, value for birds, invertebrates, etc. Particularly uh, those are lower end of the food chain that then provide food and foraging opportunities for, for those further up the, high, uh, the hierarchy. But of course, what this does do is it creates the opportunity for nature to connect with people, but also create a range of different services that nature can provide for urban developments and for developments uh, overall. And this is what we are now seeing coming forward, both from a regulator rated point of view, but also from a, a wider stakeholder point of view. So these additional green infrastructure benefits or these ecosystem service benefits can now be identified both as a baseline um, condition. So um, does it provide, does the site currently provide a value for pollination? Does it provide a value for um, air and water pollution control? Does it provide an opportunity for um, urban heat amelior amelioration? 
And so these things can be identified. And similarly, therefore, where development should go to create the most value can also be identified and mapped. Um, and what we are seeing in helping clients with now, particularly with those that have larger land holdings, is identifying where development should and shouldn't go to maximize this ecosystem value overall. And there are a number of tools out there that you can use. We use a mix of different tools to create the, uh, the, the matrix of those benefits that helps the decision making process. And I think the, the point here is that whilst we are seeing biodiversity as something that um, creates the discussion around green infrastructure, that wider ecosystem service is something that um, both our clients and the wider stakeholder groups are expecting to see come forward. This is an exercise that we've done for one of our clients, and this is Kerry Wharf. It shows the um, green infrastructure interventions and the, the value that it creates from a um, biodiversity, but also wider uh, natural capital and ecosystem service. And this can be done on a kind of dashboard um, approach. And um, just picking up on what Richard was talking about before, Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosure often sees um, uh, climate mitigation and adaptation being delivered through nature-based solutions, so that green infrastructure. And many of the people that are now reporting, albeit voluntary at the moment, are using um, nature-based solutions and green infrastructure as that, that mitigation for climate change as part of their delivery plans. But of course, uh, whilst we might understand the impact on um, from climate on real estate and buildings, um, and that can be modelled um, using various Met Office outputs, but also uh, other modelling software. What we are less clear about is the impact that um, real estate has on nature generally. So we understand the impact it has on a particular location from baselining and um, using BNG to identify the uplift. But what we don't know necessarily and was less clear is the impact that we have on um, where the materials to build those buildings come from. Um, and the value chain, the impact from the value chain. And so um, close on the heels of the task force for nature related financial, sorry, climate related financial disclosure is the TNFD, which is the task force for nature related financial disclosures. And we are generally just getting the, the, our heads around what this is, but essentially splits between businesses that have a dependency upon nature and an obvious one is agriculture but also those businesses that have dependency upon um, nature to provide materials or a service. Um, and in the real estate world, this is primarily where um, wood or, or metals or the materials of building buildings comes from. And this requires, the TNFD requires an understanding of where they come from, the impacts, and then how to mitigate those impacts. And we are therefore seeing work coming forward and, uh, 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 structures coming forward in terms of how those impacts and dependencies are identified, but then what metrics are required to show an improvement against those impacts and dependencies. And I think actually it's probably going to be a game changer. And already there are reports and assessments coming out on embodied ecological impacts associated with sand and gravel. Um, and I said wood before. So it's a very interesting space that looks at nature strategies for organisations, not just in terms of the development pipeline and the buildings um, and the sites they're looking at, but also more broadly in terms of um, where those materials are coming from. And if they are from high areas of biodiversity value, um, how that might both be affected by climate change, but also how that would need to be um, directed elsewhere so that those areas of high biodiversity value are no longer impacted in the same sort of way. So that's a kind of uh, the topic area I wanted to cover today. Um, and I can stop sharing my screen and pass over. Thanks very much. Um, we're now going to hear from Lynn Sullivan, who um, has been able to join us, thankfully. Um, Lynn, do you want to go ahead? Yes, apologies for the glitch. I'll try sharing my screen here we go can you see that yeah great so yeah i'm lynn sullivan i chair the i'm an architect by profession i chair the good homes alliance i also chair 
the National Retrofit Hub, and I'm the building's 2050 lead, 20, sorry, 2030 lead uh, for the Green Construction Board, part of Construction Leadership Council. So the Good Homes Alliance have been campaigning for better quality in homes for since we started 17 years ago. And one of the key sort of good things is, is that um, the sustainability agenda has obviously risen during that period, but it was slightly thwarted by the zero carbon homes target being scrapped in 2015. But more recently, there's been, because of the growth requirements, there's been a big focus on uh, the context and, you know, how consumers see growth and housing and as well as standards. And so the National Model Design Code um, throws a, a requirement onto local authorities that design code should be consistent with, with uh, current legislation and look ahead on sustainability. However, um, although it's good on contextual stuff, I, I, I think many of us believe it's not well integrated enough in terms of uh, the climate change uh, objectives. And that's, I'll go on to elaborate further on that. So uh, why is the planning system cited as a barrier? I mean, there have been some really good things and Mitch has just talked about the requirement for biodiversity net gain, which was enacted through the Environment Act. <clears throat> But since the Paris uh, COP, COP21 in 2015, many local authorities have made climate change, uh, climate emergency declarations, and they've been looking to reflect in their local plans uh, policies on both planning and building standards which reflect those ambitions. And uh, the, the, it's, the situation is, is confused. So um, some local authorities have had uh, uh, local plans reflecting those ambitions passed through the planning inspectorate and others have had them pushed back. And there's, there was a written ministerial statement in 2015, uh, which was never uh, enacted through the Planning and Energy Act, I think it was, or was it the uh, levelling up bill, I can't remember. Um, but um, there was a recent ministerial statement also suggesting that local authorities should not set their own standards uh, whilst uh, many of them already have. So there's a, gr a great confusion at the moment about the ability of local authorities to reflect their ambitions in both planning and building standards. And there was a very good report last year uh, from the Town and Country Planning Association, as well as the Climate Change Committee, uh, lamenting the lack of clarity really in planning regarding our net zero ambitions and it points out that some key issues for sustainability in uh, housing uh, such as uh, connectivity you know the provision of transport connections and the supporting for walking and cycling and so on that are absolutely key to the, the whole carbon footprint of a place those and uh, resource planning issues such as for water and energy uh, uh, can only really be successfully um, uh, enact enacted or supported by a bigger picture connectivity through planning authorities at regional and national level. But they really emphasise the power of planning uh, as well as uh, for building standards uh, to, to reach our goals. So, um, and they also highlight, by the way, resilience uh, adaptation measures must be addressed in both national model design codes and local planning policy. So uh, recently there's been a, a quite a few reports which uh, talk about uh, concerns about house building and house, housing quality, which uh, have been fairly consistent over the years, since, certainly since, since Good Homes Alliance have been running. And um, this report from the Competitions and Markets Authority, which is, is after all, a government arm's length body, uh, it, it calls out that neither planning nor building regs address concerns re land allocation and therefore delivery rates, as well as affordability and most importantly, quality in new homes. 
and they've even launched an investigation into a possible collusion by the major house builders in, in contravention of, of um, the Competitions Act. So uh, really some big questions here about um, the quality of our current housing and, and that's under our current regulatory framework uh, and you know whether it can be whether these issues can be addressed. At the same time, we're getting consistently consumer concerns about quality. Um, this Institute of uh, Build, Chartered Institute of Building report last uh, December, uh, based on a, a cross section of of, um, of the um, uh, house buying public, found found a huge uh, concern about new housing quality. Actually, the majority saying that they wouldn't buy a new home because of their concerns about poor workmanship and uh, that they think existing homes are a better quality, which is pretty stunning, really. Uh, and, and also the, the great white hope in terms of housing quality uh, in the form of the housing uh, new homes ombudsman has been um, pretty roundly criticised, not least by the Homeowners Alliance. So consumer concerns haven't gone away. The our, our sort of great hope, really, was the new legislation coming in under the Future Home Standard. And this was foreshadowed by the Climate Change Committee in their sixth budget of 2020, now four years ago, uh, calling for the government to publish a robust definition of Future Home Standard, preferably in advance of 23. We've only just had it at the end of last year. Um, and to implement a, a strong set of standards which made sure that buildings uh, perform as designed and delivers high, deliver high energy, high levels of energy efficiency as well as uh, heat decarbonisation. So, so uh, you know, we, we were led to expect that this would be an absolute game changer. Uh, however, the the, the uh, uh, consulta first consultation by DLUC. Um, put set out a draft standard and 72% uh, of the consultee responses said that that draft standard wasn't wasn't ambitious enough and that was in 2021. So at the background to this is that we also post Paris COP in, in uh, 2021 uh, there was many moves to, to define, if you like, moving away from the idea of a zero home standard to think about a Paris proof targets for new homes. And so this sort of la uh, added to the expectations really around the future home standard. And last year in COP28, there were more commitments to grid decarbonisation as well as energy efficiency. But uh, there are ongoing concerns, not least from the National Infrastructure Commission and the Climate Change Committee, uh, that our infrastructure is inadequate for these targets, you know, if our reliance is just on heat switching and, um, and you know, the rate of decarbonisation of the grid, because we all know that it's not just about getting more wind power, it's, it's actually about thinking about the energy mix, thinking about the times of year when the wind doesn't blow, and uh, really um, reinforcing our, our grid. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I'm sort of mounting up all these expectations, really. At the beginning of last year, I did a launch for uh, this report for our um, Good Homes Alliance. And this, um, this was a longitudinal study commissioned by government Desnes uh, of a five five years worth of, of research on exemplary new home developments called the building for 2050 if you haven't seen it and I do recommend it um, and this shows how um, even homes built to the highest current regulatory standards i.e even beyond current building regulations were not delivering certainty on performance there was still a performance gap of up to two to five times on space heating for example and that there were still issues about um, uh, overheating and and you know higher bills they weren't these new standards are not uh, delivering higher bills so it all kind of uh, came to a a crisis or a high point we were hoping uh, in December last year when we had the consultation on the future home standard finally published and um, 
uh, however uh, our view is that uh, there was very little what well, there's there's much there's no improvement in building fabric over the latest building regs um standard which was 2021 although there is an option to support integrated solar that's one of the options and it does support the electrification of heat which of course we support however although there's a new uh, uh, metric uh, calculation model it is not proposed to to change the current cal calculation which is based on a notional building there's no requirement to test building performance on completion i.e to to properly tackle that, that performance gap, only a voluntary uh, proposal for, for post-occupancy, which of course then gets involved in, in what individual um, uh, home uh, occupants uh, are, are using on their non-regulated side. And I think Mitch mentioned, uh, you know, uh, being able to count the carbon impacts of where the materials come from. There's absolutely nothing yet although we've been promised it for quite a while, on uh, the requirement for, for embodied carbon calculation, in other words, whole life carbon calculation. Um, uh, so, uh, and there's still questions about the ventilation system. So as a culmination, I, I wanted to flag today that yesterday, which was the closing of this consultation, hence the very topical discussion today, uh, we, Good Homes Alliance, along with uh, Letty, UK Green Building Council and Bioregional, have sent a letter to the Secretary of State calling for, a, for, for a, what we call a fit for purpose future home standard. And we have had 250 organisations as co-signatories, including local authorities and developers. Uh, and a host of other industry actors. So uh, I do uh, recommend you have a look at this on the Good Homes Alliance website. So, you know, we are in a climate emergency. We are in a, an environmental emergency. And we just feel that the pace of change in regulation is l sadly lagging far behind. So that's me. Thank you very much. <laughs> Great, thank you very much, Lynn. We've got uh, just under half an hour to have a conversation about some of the issues that have just been raised there. This is your opportunity to send some questions in. Um, we've already got one which asks, uh, what are the first steps organisations should be taking to help ensure they are meeting their sustainability regulatory requirements? Um, Richard, would you be able to start us off on that and give us the sort of housing association perspective? Um, yeah, yes, of course. Um, the first thing I would say would be know your data, know where your emissions are, know where your scope one, two and three are as much as you can. I know scope three is really difficult, but um, that will be the majority of most people's um, um, car carbon emissions. So. I would look at that. I would then use that to set your targets so that you've got something that's deliverable and you've got a roadmap. And then the other thing that I think that is often, well, can be missed, is actually you've got to prepare your teams, your stakeholders, your, your uh, suppliers to start changing the culture. If you don't educate and change the culture, that actually makes it really, really difficult to drive the improvements that you want to drive. You mentioned knowing your data there. Do you think the current state of uh, knowledge across the sec sector is, is strong? Do you think people have a good sense of their, their housing stock and, um, and how it's performing, for instance? I, th I would say it can be patchy. Um, in if you take our housing stock, our housing stock is not all of our, is not all of our emissions. I mean, not by a long chalk. So, um, but there are a lot of good models out there where you can work it out. There are ways of being able to take aggregated energy demand as well from different places so that you can actually work out how much um, energy you're using um, and where you can improve it. But um, I think I would say that it, people generally have got a little bit of a way to go. Great. Um, Lynn or Mitch, do either of you have a, a contribution you'd, you'd like to make on that point, the first steps that organisations should be taking uh, to meet these new requirements that are coming? 
Well, I'm delighted to hear what Richard says because, uh, uh, but actually that's got nothing to do with legislation really. It's just um, a, an informed view of how to get where we want to go. We have to stop measuring stuff better. And, and in terms of energy planning, for example, that has to mean real performance in use. And we're nowhere near that in, in, in terms of our regulatory system. Uh, as well as the thing which Mitch raised about about materials impact, because we don't have a uh, you know a requirement to even disclose, let alone limit our embodied carbon. So you know, I just I just feel in the context of our discussion today, we have to point out that uh, the you know if you want to lead and you want to get there, you have to uh, do the right thing on your own bat, really. And it's being driven, as I think Richard mentioned, um, you know, by the finance sector. Uh, that you, you know, you can't. It's no good disclosing um, notional calculations because they're proven to be way off the beam. You have to, you have to get down to grips with with the real impacts, and and that's in a way a very exciting agenda. But I would say regulation isn't help, helping at the minute. I would probably add to that as well. I think. <clears throat> and Richard makes a very good point, and we're seeing it more and more as the financial sector are, are quickly changing the way in which people anticipate and respond to wider sustainability issues, not just regulatory ones. And I think regulation is important, it has its place. But actually, it's only one of the levers we're seeing being applied at the moment. And I think the finance sector has, has a long way to go, but actually it's caused a changing of the dial really quickly. I think what we see in regulation and in planning, it, it's a bit like a, and it's a bad analogy, I know, an oil tanker turning. It's very slow in terms of it being able to make manoeuvres, but actually the financial requirements we're seeing our clients having to respond to are making those changes happen very quickly. Um, <clears throat> I think that the energy, whether we have got a great grip on it or not, people are kind of understand what they need to do around that. Um, I completely agree that there are mechanisms that, that can give you that estimate of what energy use is, but Lynn's absolutely right. There is no mechanism at the moment that regulates or needs uh, or gives us the need or requires us to um, actually report for, for actual building performance. I mean, we're seeing neighbours coming, which that's voluntary. It's only within a particular sector, but even then it's stuttered because the BRE won't take it up or didn't, so I didn't take it up as a, a mechanism to deliver neighbours in the UK. Um, so I think there is a, a way to go. I think we are grappling with it. Uh, and there's a, a, so whilst regulation, I think, has a role to play, I think broader stakeholder, stakeholder expectation is probably going to force that change more quickly. From a nature point of view, um, regulation in nature is very site specific. So when if you're developing a site in Dagenham, then it's around uh, the site conditions in Dagenham. There isn't a mechanism to understand if your material uh, comes from the Gambon or from a high um, area of biodiversity value. That currently is something which is coming through as a voluntary uh, approach. It, it will become regulation, although we have no time frame for that. It will follow on the TCFD kind of trajectory. But at the moment, what's being encouraged is the leaders taking up that that mantle of knowing that they have to do something quickly and that's what's causing that change and on that point uh you raise with regards to the, the the pressures from from the finances is that um is that something that's coming from them having to meet their own regulatory requirements what's the what's the sort of driving force there I think uh, both Richard and Lynn mentioned it, it's from the Paris commitments and the sectorial requirements to uh, adjust um, actions towards the 1.5 and beyond. So I think it's it's come from there. Uh, you know, there are certain targets. The, the challenge, I guess, to some extent is at the moment, um, sustainable finance or green finance is quite a small sector, um, albeit it's grown really quickly. The, the, what we need to do is we need to direct capital away from its current um, funding of fossil fuel and, and uh, industries that currently continue the business as usual to those businesses and interventions and operations that that leave fossil fuel dependency to one side. And whilst that is happening slowly, we collectively need to make that happen quickly. But it does change the dial 
Um, we've had clients that, that have been told that they can't get finance at all on projects unless they have firstly their own ESG objectives set in place, but also the action plan of how they get to align to the 1.5 um, uh, degree change. So it is changing the, the, the discussions really quickly. Great, thanks. We've got another audience question which says, how effective do you think the future home standard will be uh, in terms of how the new house building industry will respond? Uh, and they also ask, um, what are the major actions required for the grid to be ready for electrification of heat? Um, do you, Lynn, would you be able to take the first part of that? And then maybe Richard, if you've got any perspective on the, on the second part. Uh, well, I, I think I've probably intimated that I think, well, in terms of fabric, they don't really have to do very much because there's no change effectively. But I mean, there's a bit on commissioning of, of systems, but you're still allowed to have um, trickle vents with uh, demand uh, extract ventilation, continuous extract. So I would say no great change on fabric, but obviously people are having to come to grips with heat pumps. And I would you know i have that's why i have really concerns about this leaving aside the performance gap in terms of regulation because as we know you know if you're dealing with a, a home that as per that study i mentioned the home for 20 homes for 20 building for 2050 if you're getting a, a massive underperformance on space heating then the the heat pump you know is it doesn't know you know it's sized presumably for the worst case scenario in which case it won't work so well it won't last so well it might might be noisier because it's working over time. So, so you know, I'm really concerned that we need to sort of tighten up the whole package, which is what we've been saying really um, in our in our response to the future homes. So I I don't see that much difference. I mean, there are some issues about the way the calculation methodology has been has been. Um, tweaked and the because we've only got a beta version of it and that's very sort of technical but you know from as i understand it there's it's it's very difficult the house builders are, are, are saying we they really need the proper bit of kit to, that they're going to have to use for compliance that's only fair really that they should they should have a, a an up and running version it just seems to me it's 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 incomplete as a package which is is very much the, the tone of our of our response Great. And Richard, on that point regarding the electrification of heat. Um, well, I mean, we absolutely welcome heat to be electrified. We need to move away from gas. You can't you can't decarbonize without moving away from gas. So that's good. Um, and there has been a slow take up. So anything that drives it forward, and this should do, <coughs> uh, that uh, we welcome that. But yeah, as Lynn said, I, it could have gone further. It could have, uh, it still doesn't really address performance gap. And we could have done some more with uh, with fabric. Though obviously that increases costs uh, for what, for the, for the homes we're trying to build. But I th it's, it's a small step on the right direction is probably where I would say, where I'd go with it. You mentioned that heat ne networks are not something that we're quite as used to in the UK as as perhaps people are um, in Europe. Is there is there sort of an education piece here in terms of um, making making the public who aren't necessarily as familiar um, more aware of the benefits and, and battles and potential scepticism and, and whose responsibility is is that? Would you? <laughs> Um, well, I think it's probably everyone's responsibility within the industry. But I think the difference I've found when you go, go to Europe or when you speak to people in European cities, they tend to, they're much, they're much more around, um, this is good for us. Whereas we're more individualistic. And so actually the, a lot of it is around the culture of uh, of taking away somebody's individual gas boiler that everyone knows, everyone understands and saying, right, you're going to have this, but you're going to have to link into a system. So there's a there's a cultural piece to it. There's also, I think we need to be quite honest around the efficiencies of heat networks and why they're there. Um, it's quite difficult to get data actually around the performance of heat networks. <clears throat> um, but the also, 
we need to make it more um, more desirable. The fifth generation networks can do heating and cooling. And if you're in London or if you're in a big city, it's going to get hot in the future. And actually the ability to cool your home is going to be just as important as um, in the summer as keeping it warm in the winter. So I think that we haven't done enough marketing. And I think that probably that's where we need to go. We need to market that this is a really good solution that enables us to decarbonize um, and is the future and offers benefits. It's a bit like an electric car. They're seen as aspirational things. And that's what you, we need to make heat networks. Sorry, I'm not sure that really answers your question, but that's my current thinking around heat networks. Great. Um, we've got a question here about how, uh, obviously the, 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 there's a big question around how environmental regulations will impact on housing supply. And there've been a couple of um, uh, house builders this, this year who sort of come out and, and been a little bit critical of the, the burden of regulation sort of coming through the pipeline and how it's affecting their ability to um, proceed with schemes. How do you think organisations can sort of strike a balance between viability and environmental stewardship, particularly when we're already in a fairly difficult um, housing market already? Mitch, maybe you could um, give a... Uh, I, th I think the, the identification of what these implications are will form part of their viability assessment. And whilst, of course, um, we need to be delivering homes uh, in volume to address the shortage. What we don't want to be doing is is delivering homes that need to be retrofitted in five years' time because they won't be fit for purpose. They'll overheat or, um, uh, you know, they're too inefficient in terms of uh, uh, being cost-effective to, to keep warm or cool in the future. So, of course, we need to make sure that uh, they come forward in a way in which they are viable and can be delivered but it's like anything, I think, you know, it's just identifying what the, those requirements are and putting them into the viability and making sure that there's mechanisms by which they can be delivered. The other thing, of course, is to identify is um, we, what we don't want to be doing is excluding areas that should and could have homes being delivered in them uh, because there is a, a focus on uh, the existing model and short term returns. What we we collectively need to do as an industry is think about longer term returns and you know is that over a, a, a different business model and if what that business model is i mean there's lots of interesting projects and joint ventures coming forward where the housing association or the volume house builders and the local authority are you know bringing sharing the risk and looking at how those homes can be delivered in a way that creates um good quality homes that are easy to heat and keep warm, but don't necessarily look at it in a very short time frame. It's a longer term time frame. And I think collectively, the industry has to think about that. Um, and we need to enable that to happen. So there's two, two for me, two principal needs here. One is new homes that are cheap and good, uh, easy to keep to warm and keep warm. But we can't do that at the detriment of the environment and the climate, can we? So, you know, it's a difficult answer to, to find, but there are mechanisms out there and collectively we need to find what those models look like. Great. We've got um, a question comment here that says, what I take from the panel is that meeting the future home standard is not that onerous for house builders. However, it requires heat pumps. Uh, and the supply chain for heat pumps is underdeveloped and demand low. Uh, the question is, is heat pumps and the sort of immaturity of that market and the, 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 the lack of progress um, in building that market up, is that going to be a blocker to um, us being able to meet those, those re standards required um, by the future? Lynn, could you, could you take that? Yeah, uh, I think it is an issue. And I think the last print, uh, government target was something like 600,000 heat pumps a year by 2028. And we're, uh, you know, we had just haven't got enough installers and that the rate of installations is, is 
woefully low against against that target. I think part of the problem is that although there have been these carrots dangled about, you know, they're cheap. Well, they're not exactly cheap, but they're cheaper because there's a government grant, obviously. But, um, you know, there are still people do have concerns. Uh, I reflect them in, in my slides, you know, these concerns about quality and the evidence that of underperformance means that people you know quite genuinely have concerns that uh, just a switch from gas to a heat pump will actually potentially cost them more and and the only way to just to to increase the confidence is to tune up the the baseline of regulation which um you know is not is not happening so whilst there's still that possibility for some really negative uh, 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 what would you call them? Co, co disbenefits. <laughs> um, you know, whilst you know the potential of a backlash, the Daily Mail factor, then I think you know consumer confidence isn't going to increase. So heat pump that take up is is really at risk. Even though this is the one big uh, sort of positive about this about this future home standard that we need to electrify, as as, Rich, as both Richard and Mitch have said, you know it's a absolutely inevitable we must stop using fossil fuels and making our problems worse but along with the switch we need these other things to be in place to be able to really get motoring and you know if it is the scale that we're talking about this is a fantastic market opportunity and we should be getting you know uk heat pump suppliers by the lorry load and investment in in manufacturing but we're not because of these sort of gray areas and so it, it, it's a wasted opportunity at the minute. We've got a question here about the circular economy, um, which says that the laws and regulations uh, for consumer protection are a barrier to progress on this point. Um, the question is, what is the way forward on this? Does anyone have a, a perspective on that? Uh, um, we haven't encountered that as yet. So from a circular economy point of view in, in the building sector and real estate world, I think there is an increasing recognition that um, uh, firstly, there's a presumption in favour of keeping an existing building rather than necessarily knocking it down and looking to rebuild for the sake of rebuilding. But that does also need to be taken into consideration in the context of how does that building perform in energy terms and environmental terms. So. Um, I think we, it's it's not a black and white in terms of keeping existing buildings and not bringing forward new buildings. It's a more complicated, nuanced argument than that. But actually, if you're thinking about um, buildings, uh, what we should be thinking about them as, as a material bank. So, you know, the amount of bricks they've got, the amount of pieces of timber, you know, how many windows they've got. And if they do need to be changed or, or they're no longer fit for purpose for whatever reason, how do you repurpose those existing building blocks? So it's a bit like Lego, you know, you, you design it so that you can put it together, but you can also design it so you take it apart and then reuse it. Some of the, the challenges, understanding the use of that particular piece of timber or that particular um, steel beam. So there is a challenge there about the integrity of that material and how it's being used. But there are ways that you can identify that piece um, the people are using BIM as that, re re that res repository of information and you can keep that level of um, usage with that particular piece of material and you can track it and therefore you have that understanding of the warranty will still be in place. So there are ways around it. Of course, we are. It, it, it's fair to say that we are in the embryonic stages of understanding what the circular economy means in the real estate world. We have an existing housing and broader real estate stock that is quite old that wasn't designed with those factors in mind um we are getting our heads around what it means for new buildings and how we can repurpose and reuse materials from old buildings but uh uh and i'm pretty certain that that things will get easier but there are a number of technical as well as uh, regulatory and stakeholder expectations that are causing some of those barriers already thanks mitch um it might be good for us to We've got a couple of minutes left. It might be good for us to sort of turn our attention to uh, the end of the year or some point in the year when we're expecting a general election. Obviously, there's a decent chance there might be a change of government. How do you think uh, 
a, a switch to the Labour Party, for instance, might change some of this regulatory landscape? Are we expecting them to um, make any big moves in this area? Um, Richard, could you start us off on that? Um, I think the um, well, certainly for social housing, I <clears throat> there's been uh, some positive noises coming out of the of the Labour Party. So I would hope that they're going to support a little bit more around uh, new buildings and in retrofitting. But the one I'm really interested to see what's going to happen is around GB Energy. And actually, they've got an opportunity here to really start cleaning up our grid and actually whether or not they start to play a role in heat networks. So I think I think that's a really exciting thing for me. Right. Lynn, is there anything um, you're hearing from the Labour uh, Party? Well, I was going to say the same thing, really, but for slightly different reasons, because, you know, there's a huge difference between having a target for 2030 to decarbonise our grid and 2035. And if the latter really does become a, a, a real target, then we've got to motor and we've also got to close down you know the 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 variables that exist with the performance uh, and the underperformance of our existing stock as well as the close you know nailing the performance of our new buildings so so i think in order to achieve that target you have to tighten those things up but you know to to accelerate it to 5 years rather than 10 is is a big ask and it would be a great ambition as far as i i can see uh, I was just going to add and maybe just echo what Lynn has said about the opportunity. I think the thing that um, people in the real estate are struggling with is that supply chain is the people that have those skills to both build buildings and homes that we need in the future, but also the retrofit skills as well, particularly in buildings that have heritage or conservation value. And I think that what I would like to see is is the government get behind a training program and, and supply chain program that actually enables that opportunity to come to reality i think there's a huge huge transition risk that we have with the existing industries and and workmen and the traditional um, building um, sector that we need to move into what those new buildings will need to do and and how they'll need to operate so i think for me it's both the policy framework being strengthened but also a leadership around new jobs and green jobs and enabling the bis the, the industry to to invest in those areas with with certainty that, that it will be supported into the long term great thanks mitch we're gonna have to wrap up in a second but um there's just one question about housing associations that i'd be keen to get richard's view on um emma furphy or furful asks what's the view of the panel on hydrogen powered heating as an alternative to fossil fuels and how much is it hurting the industry with the government not committing either way yet it's difficult for housing associations to make investment decisions without that commitment is that your perspective richard and what's your view of the um, of um the process of hydrogen so hydrogen uh, uses more fossil fuel currently to produce than you get out of the energy so and let but i accept that there will be places where there's huge concentrations of industry where they need a flame, that, that hydrogen networks will grow there. But for the vast majority of, of uh, housing associations who are not in those highly industrialized areas where they can use it as a byproduct, I think that hydrogen's a dead duck. From that point of view, it'll be used for maybe battery store energy storage as potential energy, but um, electrification is the way to go. Great, thanks Richard. That is about all we have time for. Thank you everyone for joining. I hope you've all found it as informative as I have. Um, you will be able to get the session on demand, as I mentioned earlier, via the same link if you want to watch it again. Uh, it should be available about an hour after we finish. Uh, if you want to find out more about our upcoming events, you can find details on our website. And um, One more thing is when we finish, you should see a little survey come up. If you can fill this in, uh, that will be much appreciated. It only takes 30 seconds or so, but it helps us a lot. Thank you again for watching and have a nice day, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Daniel. Thanks all.